All right, so I'm Chris Stone. I'm the director of Boone County Arboretum. Welcome tonight uh, at our tree fund event. It's been about since 2019, since we had this in person. We've had a couple of Zoom versions of this, Zoom only. So we're very happy to have you all here tonight uh, to do this all in person. So this uh, goes towards our tree fund, as I mentioned, as supports tree education, uh, research, and exploration. Uh, that's what it stands for. And so that means going on collecting trips, going all over the country to grab plants for the Arboretum, and also supporting our research activities that we do for the Arboretum's accreditation. So uh, we do appreciate all of the support that you're bringing to us tonight by being here. And those wonderful plants in the back, the sun auction goes into that fund as well. So uh, can't thank you enough for that. And um, I also want to make sure that I thank our lead sponsor for the event tonight. That would be Bartlett tree experts. They're here tonight in big numbers. There's a bunch of them around in the crowd. <laughs> and of course, that's why Adam is here with us. He is also part of that group. He is the assistant curator at the Bartlett Arboretum down in North Carolina in Charlotte. And he's also the uh, manager of their propagation at Bartlett Arboretum. So um, you all have probably seen all of the descriptions about him over the last few weeks. If you're here tonight, you've seen all those emails and things I sent out. So I won't blab and blab and blab and embarrass him, but I'll turn this over now to Adam and let him uh, talk a little bit about what he does and all of the wonderful places he has been. So, and one last group to thank. I have to thank all of our wonderful volunteers that made that great spread of food there that you've been enjoying and also for decorating all of the rest of the room. We'll turn it over to Adam. <laughs> Remote my uh, camera here to follow me. <laughs> it's following you. Okay. It's following you. <laughs> okay. No, I tend to wander, so it's a good thing. I have to do a lot of Zoom meetings. Zoom hybrid meetings before we're plastered in front of a podium, and it's hard for me to stay in one spot. But uh, yeah, thanks y'all for having me. Um, I uh, uh, when I was making this talk, I just didn't know where to go with it. There's just too many directions. I when it comes down to it, I'm just a total plant nerd. I just <laughs> if. Uh, uh, I was not chasing plants somewhere. I would just uh, go nuts. Um, but it's uh, a little bit about me. I just, uh, again, I've just always been involved in the plant world. I just can't help it. I lived in uh, Florida originally and uh, got to start working at the Kanapa Botanic Gardens in Gainesville, Florida. Uh, I was originally going to go to University of Florida and then I got injured and had to drop out my first semester and then uh, just due to the sequence events I never went back to school and uh, I'm, I used to say I was self-taught but really it was just from knowing lots of good people in the in the field here we all just kind of share our knowledge and uh, we all build upon that so it was definitely not just I taught myself my notes in the books even though I was doing that but uh, um, and even though I didn't go to school I Ended up managing a molecular laboratory at the University of Florida, the Forest Pathology Laboratory. Again, it was just all through knowing people and knowing my abilities. And uh, that got me places at the same time. My uh, late wife and I, we uh, owned a uh, rare plant nursery in Florida, just doing mail order. It was just her sole, or her sole source of income. And uh, while I was still working at, the, at UF, and that gave us some chance to travel, which I'll mention a little bit. And eventually ended up at uh, what was in Peckerwood Garden, um, which has now been renamed um, <laughs> to a more tasteful name, uh, the John Perry Garden in front of the uh, founder. We'll go over that in a little bit too. Um, and uh, then I went out on my own for a while. We'll talk about that. And now I'm at Bartlett, and Bartlett is just uh, enabling me to uh, just really do a lot of great things for, for them. and. Uh, well, again, keeping you sane. <laughs> so, I mean, as a kid, I mean, I I grew up in Miami. Um, my father from day one had me out in the Everglades, and I loved it. 
And I, I just put that stand going back to the city. I just wanted to still be a hermit up in the <laughs> in the woods there. I didn't care about all the mosquitoes and snakes. I love snakes, I love red alligators, I love everything. Um, but my father had lots of books around the house and lots of old books. And I just always was gravitated towards like that Victorian era where people you hear about all these uh, um, explorers going off to faraway lands and dealing with savages and animals and losing half their men, but coming back with that rare prized orchid <laughs> that some of the rich people in uh, in Europe could uh, keep them in their glass houses there. So there's all these romanticized uh, um, drawings of people up in trees. Uh, Snatching these orchids here, and of course, dealing with giant snakes there, which again I love. So, um, so yeah, this just always appealed to me. I just always wanted to travel and get out, um, nerding out uh, just in all parts of the world where uh, a lot of these early folks have been going. It was just that true of adventure that I just really wanted. And, uh, you probably heard of some of the the plant explorers that have been. Uh, um, really made a lot of contributions in their late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, since Ernest Wilson, also called, he earned the name Chinese Wilson because he was basically at home in China, just uh, bringing all these plants back. He brought a lot back for the Arnold Arboretum, and uh, those got all over the place as well. And uh, so he got these whole collecting expeditions with all these folks here and uh, bring all this great stuff back. But then, even with modern day uh, plant collecting, like in my Teenage years, I mean, I knew of Dan Hinckley's probably, there's a lot of modern day plant explorers that are still doing this sort of thing, but he was just kind of that guy that everybody knew and uh, I just always looked up to and I wanted to be doing that same thing too, just bringing back all these cool things. But then it just started dawning on me, all of my jaunts out in the Everglades, I was having these adventures here. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, nobody else goes out into these swamps here full of all this stuff. Who, who in their right mind would do that? Um, I mean, this is a uh, fat hatching strand where uh, generally the water is anywhere from like chest deep to, to ankle deep, depending on the, the rainfall that year. But this water is very, it's like full of tannins. It's very dark. And so you don't know you're upon an alligator that erupts in front of you. Yeah. And that's part of the fun. <laughs> just all these trees are just loaded with all these different uh, bromeliads and ferns and orchids and just all sorts of cool stuff in there. It's just easy to get lost back in there. That's the only place I've ever been lost in my life is that <laughs> thing. And the only way this was before I had GPS or compasses or anything. The only way I got back, I kind of, it was an overcast day, so I couldn't tell where the sun was. And I uh, started uh, paying attention to the planes that were flying towards Miami. Yeah. to the east so i just hope for the best i was right and ended up kind of getting back where i thought i needed to get but, uh, it was dark by that point but uh no, i just loved it i mean it was just kind of my little faraway land where uh, folks in europe were going to the amazon or southeast asia or wherever to get all these crazy orchids and ferns and things for the uh, all the uh, folks to keep in there Wardian cases and their steam houses and, and all these things. Yet here, I have all this just outside of Miami. And I never met anybody else out there. I was the only crazy person out there finding all these things. And so, yeah, there's a lot of uh, epiphytic orchids out there. This is like one of the more common ones here. You can tell with that photo, but the flowers are uh, um, arching off to the right there. It's uh, encyclopedia pump empty. And then there's uh, some epidendrums at the bottom. And then there's terrestrial ones here too, which is probably one of my favorites. This whole area, you probably know the ghost orchid made famous by uh, the Orchid Thief uh, book. Uh, I, I was out there trying to around beforehand. So, uh, <laughs> um, but I like this one. I mean, I think this is even more beautiful than the, than the ghost orchid out there. And it's only found in two little sites and nowhere else. And I just stumped upon it. And, Everybody else is always wondering where it is out there because you can't just go up walking in the woods and find it, know where it is. So very elegant orchid. And as a kid, I mean, I was, again, a weird kid. I didn't like video games. I had my nose in my little 1950s, 1960s field guides. That's all I had to work with at the time. Um, and if I hadn't seen it, I needed to go find it, basically. So one day I was out 
in a mangrove swamp. Um, I was actually uh, kayaking around and uh, getting lost fishing. And uh, everybody has their stop and go take a leak story. That's when you find all the rare work. <laughs> rare plants in the Everybody's got their, their story. So out here, there's really no land. It's just these flooded uh, mangrove swamps with all the still roots uh, sticking up above the water. So you can't really walk through all this. But there was this one area where there was this uh, tree falling down, another a buttonwood tree. And uh, it was just a convenient spot to get up on the log and just uh, take a leak. And so I got up there, and uh, this isn't it, but this is uh, what I found this uh, mistletoe cactus. Um, it's an epiphytic species growing up on the trees, and this tree had fallen down. It still had one on it, hanging down just above the waterline. And I didn't know what it was at first, but it was just the craziest thing. And uh, got back and looked through all my books and figured out what it was. And then also in my field guide, that my old field guide, it said that this, or I'm, I'm sorry, it was one of my newer field guides. It said it hasn't been seen since the 1960s. It was considered uh, extinct from Florida. Mm -hmm. It still is found in the Caribbean and in the South America. But mm -hmm. The Florida ones, nobody had seen it. And here it is. And, uh, so uh, stupid me as a kid, I didn't. It was in a national park. And, but still took a peek and um, still have it growing today. I'm not supposed to, but uh, <laughs> eventually I did tell the park botanist at uh, in the nice National Park about it, and uh, he was all excited because I still hadn't seen it. This was uh, in the 90s that I finally told him. And uh, so he was like, who cares? Let's go, go find it again. Yeah. And so we went back there, and unfortunately, a uh, hurricane that went through, it was actually Hurricane Katrina. Um, had uh, knocked down that tree even more into the water. And so it basically drowned that cactus. And we looked all over the place. We still haven't okay. found any. So yep, I still have that <laughs> illegal one in my possession there. I definitely don't do that anymore, though. Definitely, uh, especially collecting for botanic gardens. We want to be all messed up. We do get a permit for that. But uh, it's not one of those things you just kill it at this point. I mean, it's the last of it. Uh, Genetic material from Florida. At age five, um, my family did a trip all throughout the western U.S. It's my first time I've really seen anything out of, outside of Florida, and I don't know why we went to Yellowstone, we went to Glacier, we went all over these wonderful places. But West Texas, at age five, just did it for me. I, I don't know why I just needed to go back, and uh, my family never did. Uh, take me back there uh, in my younger years, but uh, it was just always calling to me, just all these broad experiences, all these crazy plants, even though, again, we're seeing the same things that we could have heard in Yellowstone, the Rockies, and elsewhere, but it was just such a special place, and it was just so weird for the five years to be imprinting on that sort of thing. So I mentioned my nursery, this is my my mispropagation bench is a portion of it. These are all cuttings that are set up for propagation and doing lots of uh, uh, mail order, just rare plants that uh, nobody else had. And uh, when my uh, wife and I started this, uh, we just decided, well, this is the time. We need to just go go somewhere else in the, in the world. I'd never been outside the country at that point. And I was talking to some folks like, you know, Tony Avent at Plant Delights Nursery and uh, Mark Winnington at uh, J.C. Ralston Arboretum and uh, Camilla Forest Nursery, David Parks. They had all just got back from Taiwan and were recommending to me, basically, this is the place to go as your first collecting trip. It's easy to get permits, get material out of there. It's easy to get, get around. And, and there's just so much there suitable for the Southeast where I was at the time. And so we went and had a blast. I mean, it was just absolutely amazing up in these misty mountains here to seeing it just crazy diversity. I mean, you get in these forests here in the understory and just every single plant on the ground is just something different. It's not like around here where you get your core groups of grasses and a couple perennials that are kind of dominant in there. Every, there is no dominant thing. Everything is something different. And uh, it was just the craziest thing. And then you look up and every tree is different and every tree is covered in epiphytes and you can just spend forever there. And just like these are on the bridges here looking down you can just see all the diversity in these places. And it's just so 
wonderfully laid out. It's not, it's not like a jumble or anything. It's just so unusual. And so we brought back all sorts of cool things, cool new things, cultivation like Clipcarpus nakii with this red new growth here. This fern, it's hard to judge scale, but this was taller than me. It's not a tree fern, but uh, just has these immense fronds. And these are all growing areas where they were experiencing uh, frost. <clears throat> little oak relative with the Carpus panisii. Just a beautiful foliage, evergreen. Everybody hates Smilax, but uh, this was a Smilax that does not find. It just uh, has these, uh, it just forms like a little clump, like an epimedium or something. That's why I thought it was at first, but uh, it just has these long uh, clusters of uh, petioles and this, these leaves. So all these weird things. Prunus, this was actually in the Pushan Botanic Gardens, uh, Taiwan Forestry Research Institute that uh, um, Mark Levington had given me collect, uh, connections to. And they just basically let me go in and pick cuttings or whatever I wanted. I felt like a kid in a candy store. So you don't see prunus very often that just have this like bright glowing orange bark on it that's exfoliating and making all these wonderful patterns, kind of rivaling like a crepe myrtle or something like that. And it's evergreen too. It has these huge leaves. You can tell that. Um, unfortunately, I lost all the cuttings. They never. Uh, they got delayed in shipment coming back, and they were they had defoliated. And I still tried to graft them, and it was just a long time to get anything. And even uh, sedges. There's this thing just was driving by. I saw a flash of red. Thought it must be flowers. So I stopped to see what it was, and it's a it's a freaking sedge. With red, bright red flower uh, seeds on it. Weird things like uh, Cypergasia orientalis. This is a member of the nettle family. It doesn't sting, but um, just a, a really beautiful plant. And so I grabbed some cuttings and then shared them with Plant Delights Nursery. And now they're selling their catalog, which uh, I was like, yes, I finally got my Plant Delights catalog here. My claim to fame, I'm getting somewhere. Uh, but uh, that's they, they had actually posted about it the other day in their blog. That's that plant now that I gave to them in their garden. It's just a really beautiful thing. Crazy ferns. Taiwan has like the highest diversity of ferns of any anywhere in the world. It's been forever. Uh, um, looking at those, you can see in my hand, I've got some erosema seeds that I just grabbed and then got instantly distracted by this. And so, yeah, as mentioned earlier, I love snakes. And I was with uh, the, my second trip to Taiwan. That's when I was still working for University of Florida. There was an opportunity to go with a uh, student in our uh, forest entomology laboratory. Just I knew the way around, and he was just totally apprehensive about going and didn't want to drive and just wanted me to kind of take him around. So I had to do. And so we were up in the mountains checking beetle traps uh, one evening, and then. Got back to the car and uh, it was like mostly dark. My headlamp was not really working really well. And I saw the snake come crawling by right next to the car here. And uh, in the waning light, I mean, it looked like um, this uh, lycodon, a wolf snake that I was really hoping to find. It's uh, um, not a dangerous one. So I just picked it up. And when I was handling it, I then realized it's a mini banded crate, one of the oh, no. most uh, venomous snakes outside of uh, Australia. Oh. Um, but it was just totally friendly. They, <laughs> they don't really uh, bite unless you really, really piss them off. But uh, after I realized what it was, I was heading a little bit more carefully. The, the student I was with hates snakes, and uh, he was just totally freaked out by that. And uh, he was like, you could have died, and I would have to drive back to the town. <laughs> that night was a good night for snakes driving back. I'm always watching the roads in the evening for snakes crossing and slamming on the brakes and pissing off people behind me and who almost rear in me just for over snake. And uh, this was one I saw on the opposite lane going around this flying curve. And being that I couldn't really stop there, there's nowhere to pull off. I just kind of stopped the car quick, grabbed it, brought in the car, and then drove down to where I could pull up a little bit, get some photographs with the guy next to me who's yeah. done like snakes of any type. And so I'm holding it here while driving with one hand that's striking at him. And 
left me and so he's just freaking out and then he got freaked out even more when I told him it's uh, mildly venomous but just like a beast thing which I don't care about but I want to go let, let it get to him but uh, so after all that I mean every evening the fog rolls in that's basically what you're driving through down these roads and then all of a sudden big snake all the way across both the both lanes here just stretched out just sitting there and from a distance through the fog it proportionally it looked like a cobra which i've been wanting to see so bad and uh so i pulled off and i just went oh boy a cobra and ran out of the car towards it and uh my story's going too long here but uh he uh when i got up to it i realized it was this uh what's called a king rat snake um and also has the, the Chinese uh, name translates to stinking goddess because they <laughs> they spray musk all over you if you if you handle them. And uh, but cool snakes, I bred them and I used to breed snakes too. And I bred this and need to find one in the wild. So this big, huge, seven foot long snake, I all he sees from the car is me reaching down, picking it up, and it just biting the crap out of me as I'm trying to pose it for photos. And <laughs> I start hearing from the car, why are you doing this to me? Why are you doing this to me? And, uh, I kept yelling back, it's not a cobra, it's not a cobra. He wasn't hearing me. And he's like, you're gonna die. Why are you doing this to me? So finally I got my photos and let it go and got back in the car and covered in blood and thinking of musk and you know, he just did not have a good day. But, uh, all sorts of neat uh, jack in the pulpit teracemas. This one I couldn't even I identify the species. And you can see the red down in there. The point doesn't work. That's actually the fruit that I collected. Still grow some of those. It's slow to propagate though. Stuck urus, um, dangling uh, fruits on it. And then another duck in the woods to urinate story. Um, that my first trip to Taiwan, I was just pulled off the side it was going and it's all misty in there and dark and something caught my eye and looked down it was this uh, neat little cluster of uh, jack in the pulpits here but it was in October which basically all erosema to my knowledge bloom in spring I just didn't know what was going on <laughs> got closer and just these beautiful uh, inflorescences and then a beam of light came through the fog and illuminated it it's just Absolutely oh. beautiful. Later found out it's Erosema dunbergii variety autumnale, which is the only fall flowering Erosema. Mm -hmm. And so, and it's very rare too um, in, in uh, Taiwan. So I told uh, folks from uh, Far Reaches Farm, they were going to Taiwan after me. I said they were going right at the right time for seeds uh, in spring whenever all the other Erosemas were flowering. So I told them where it was, please go get it. And they went back and they, uh, Taiwan is, has all this very steep topography that's very prone to landslides. And this was oh. apparently the site where it was. But that's the highway in there. They would build these kind of roofs over certain parts of the, area, the highways that were prone to landslides. So the land would hopefully just go over the road and then they could bulldoze the rest away. But it just totally destroyed that whole mountain slope. So. They looked all around and couldn't find it. So and they were able to uh, get some from a cultivated source in Taiwan. So they're trying to bulk that up and sell it. There's a number of holes in one, one which we wouldn't throw here. But, uh, so, yeah, we're starting to have some of these adventures here, but not quite like these here. They've lost the 20 times in Taiwan. Breeze through these. These are some of the Hodisha flares, Uria. Beautiful tree. All those are flowers on the undersides of the branches. And the problem is it smells like like a male tomcat urine, um, very potently. I found this uh, sumac. Normally they're just all green, but there was this one individual, the bunch that uh, had purple on the underside. So sometimes you find these kind of weird things. You know, nobody likes sumac. I do, but uh, brought some back and still couldn't. Give it away to many people. It, like, it's just going to suck her around and be ugly. It's beautiful. 
<clears throat> driving down the road and I just saw this big uh, dark mass up in this nondescript tree here and uh, knew it was uh, probably a uh, fern, yeah, one of the epiphytic ferns. And so stopped and went to get a closer look. And on the way in, all around the base of the trees, all this crazy stuff. That was the first time I'd seen cast iron plant, Aspidistra in the wild, toad lilies, Tricertus. And that's basically that fern that was up there. And I mean, it's this huge mass of about seven, eight feet in diameter up there in the tree branches. And so I'm gawking at that. And it's all these other epiphytes, club mosses, and it's weird uh, nettle relatives that just grow kind of clinging to the tree branches there. And uh, my wife at the time said, it's a maple. <laughs> I, I wasn't even looking at the tree, but the tree, she noticed all the uh, the Samaras, the little winged uh, fruits that are so distinctive to maples. But you look at the foliage and it's nothing like a maple. But I'd known that there are these uh, simple leaf maples out there and they're evergreen too, so they don't give you any fall color or anything, which most people want in maple. But it's just, of course, a typical cool, nerdy plant. So we collected tons of seeds of that and shared that around a bit. And it has this nice purple new growth. Wouldn't grow up here for you guys, unfortunately. But and of course, when it's time to go home, you gotta do all the cleaning. You gotta wash all the soil off the roots to be able to get your phytosanitary permit because um, they you're basically not allowed to move any speck of soil around. So hotels do not like <laughs> this when you clog up the sink with all the dirt. I was trying to find my uh, better photo. This is actually a pretty clean uh, operation here, and I. I had one where there's just dirt all over the place. But. And uh, get things back and propagate them. This was, uh, this is just one of those examples of uh, what I like to do. Make sure you share your plants around. Don't be the only person with anything. I brought back cuttings of this uh, Neolithia in the Laurel family. The undersides are just covered with these golden hairs that are just reflective and picture doesn't do it justice. So, I mean, it looks metallic. It's just... Uh, shimmering gold on the underside, dark green on top. And uh, couldn't find any fruits on this. I brought some cuttings back and had them on my miss bench. And then a few weeks later, Rod Niederman used to be at the Atlanta Botanic Garden stopped by my house and we're sharing plants. And I just gave him some of the cuttings. They weren't rooted yet. I said, here, take some of these in case I can't root them. He, he could root anything. And uh, after that, all my cuttings died, never rooted. I totally forgot that I had given him many of them. I, it was like six or eight years later, I was up in their greenhouses walking around and I was like, oh, where'd you get this? And he's like, look at the tag, Adam Black. I totally forgot that was it. He had this big, wonderful tree there. So now I've never been able to root it at all. Just, uh, <laughs> I keep getting cuttings of that plant and they haven't been able to root it ever since then either. So. You never know with this stuff, but I'm glad I got that to him. That's what we all like to do. We like to get plants around here. We never want to be the only one with something. <laughs> when I was working for the Forest Pathology Laboratory, we got to get uh, some trips back where nobody else gets to go in New Caledonia, um, land of all the Dr. Susian trees here. <laughs> Uh, if you don't know New Caledonia, it's a little speck out in the Pacific there. It's very isolated from uh, all the other island groups in there. And it's just uh, uh, this big, long island that's known for all of its uh, very prehistoric lineages of plants. Um, it was thought that it was just kind of like a time capsule from the time of the dinosaurs. And, and uh, that since then, there's debatable thoughts that this entire um, um, Island was submerged totally for millions of years and didn't reemerge until Miocene about 20 million years ago. So it got colonized from somewhere again, if that's true. But nobody knows where that is because many of these things have no relatives anywhere else, or at least they did not persist anywhere else in great numbers. So it's just one of those weird mysteries. And always wanted to go here. We were here for these uh, Agathus Montana, and it only grows on one mountaintop, and they were dying and the tribal folks there they consider this the embodiment of their ancestors they were very concerned about it they didn't care about anything else in the understory unfortunately that was also dying because we determined it was a pig issue well, the pigs were turning up the understory and the whole on the shallow soil the soils were sloughing away and so these were 
basically had no roots in the soil and were dying. But meanwhile, all these other plants, many of which probably weren't even described, were just totally lost. So really beautiful trees, the ones that are still surviving. But uh, yeah, it was just a great experience to be out there living with the uh, the Kanak people, the tribal folks there, um, the original inhabitants of the uh, island. And uh, um, Julio, the guy on the left there, got the machete. Um, he just was never happy. And you just always want to be nice to someone who's never happy with the machete in the jungle. So he would just like order us around in Kanak or in French, um, which is, it's a French territory there. So I don't know either of those languages and I didn't know what he was saying, but we just obeyed. And at one point he just kept yelling at us, booty foo, booty foo. And then like motioning us over and we just kept walking for like, must have been a couple miles through all this dense jungle. He just kept saying, booty foo, booty foo. And then finally we got to this little waterfall here and he said, booty foo, beauty is beautiful. And we realized what he's talking about. That was really trying to really show any, like, you could tell that there was a soft side to him that he likes waterfalls here. But uh, he, he wanted us to get his picture with them here. Uh, we had lots of good uh, bush fruit here. Lots of crazy things most people wouldn't want to eat. Here. Slept in these little huts. Which I thought was ridiculous. They have all these wonderful endemic plants here with crazy flowers and things, and they're planting marigolds. We were hiking through up all these mountains here. It was crazy. It was just absolutely beautiful. And getting these layers with these cloud forest environments where everything's covered in. They call this the mossy forest, but really there's no mosses here. It's all filmy ferns, basically these little tiny ferns that are filmy. Um, and they just cover everything in these uh, just saturated environments. Some of them are really blue and silver like that. Crazy ferns. I think the only time I've ever had a, one of my social media posts like practically go viral was that one on the left there. Um, that's a fertile frond of this one uh, lectum species. And it just makes you wonder when you think of ferns, all they do is they put up these fronds, they release spores in the wind, and that's that. They are they don't need pollinators or anything like that. They just kind of do their thing. That's why they've survived for so many millions of years. But why would that one, that's a fertile frond there. So all those red tips there where the spores are released, why would it need all that crazy ornamentation just to be able to dump spores in the wind? So it makes you wonder if there's more going on with that sort of thing. So higher elevations, we were here to look at these, another de declining uh, high elevation tropical conifer that Ericaria Humboldtii, um, they look like the Norfolk pines, like you buy Christmas, but it's a different species. Only found them six mountain tops there. And they're all dying as well. And it wasn't due to the thing. There's actually uh, a complex issue of uh, things going on in there. And we had to hel be helicoptered into a lot of these areas here. And every time we did that, there was always an issue. This one, the helicopter pilot uh, ended up uh, uh, mashing up his rotor on the vegetation back there, and he was like kind of bending things back into place. And <laughs> didn't really make us uh, feel comfortable, yeah. That's another species of Ericaria Mueller eye. It's just, you just feel like you're in another world. And tropical conifer, uh, Neocalotropsis, going by this waterfall, and they take on all these weird contorted forms, and the wind swept. Maki is what they call it, it's just this rocky open plains. These things look like bromeliads on a stick. These are actually a uh, uh, blueberry relative, even though you'd never guess that. Dracophilum. These also occur in New Zealand and other places, but uh, there's a wide diversity of these things in New Caledonia. Gymnostomas, they put all these weird bonsai forms. Mm. These little ferns that look like little green tapeworms standing at attention. And then this was the true adventure when we went to Kukui Massa. This is, if you know, like the tapuis in Venezuela, they're kind of like these giant mesas with steep sides. You can't hike up them. You have to be helicoptered in. And uh, so we were brought in, dropped off, and uh, we're going to be up there for three days. And then they were going to come get us. 
And we had a satellite phone and um, he had told us that if they're all clouded in on that third day and he couldn't land, to let call back, let him know, and that he'd come the next he we wouldn't be able to come the next day because the president of the island had the helicopters, only like two helicopters on the island, and said we'd need to wait another day to so those bring extra food. So we did. And uh, did our work up there. Those are the air carriers up along the ridge there. We were camping in tents on all that red stuff there, or these uh, sundews. We found there these crazy plants. This was neat. See, this is a gardenia relative that's only found on that mountaintop and nowhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, they, the, we had uh, one of the botanists with us. And he said every time he'd been up, they'd never been flowering. So that was the first time he had seen it. So, of course, on that day that we were supposed to be picked up, it was cloudy wind. So we knew we had another day to kill up there. So we just enjoyed it and continued exploring. And uh, so then the day after that, um, we're like, woke up and again, like this. And we kept calling back on the satellite phone and um, we're getting a response. It said it was sending, it said our messages were going through, but uh, we weren't hearing anything. So we were just hoping he was uh, getting our messages because he wasn't showing up or anything, of course. And uh, another day passed, another day passed. The two guys from the government who were with us, they were up there monitoring some uh, uh, recording equipment for bird uh, sounds up there. They were just going through our food like crazy. And mm -hmm. meanwhile, I'm stashing food away. It's, there's just nothing to eat up there. There's no mammals up there. So none of the plants evolved have like any fleshy fruits or anything. Most we could eat were like Podocarpus uh, arils. Yeah. Tastes like resin and a little touch of cherry maybe to it. But uh, so we're getting low on food and wondering. What's going to go on here? We still are not receiving any word from uh, um, from the pilot here, and I don't even remember what day it was. It all just ran together, and it was getting kind of hairy there. I thought we we're going to have to resort to cannibalism. <laughs> I already had I already had the, one of the two government guys picked out that it was just easy to just pump themselves up there. Um, and, I, and I figured this would be great. When, this was when I was working at. Uh, Pecker with this last uh, time in New Caledonia, so I figured it'd be great for our newsletter. I could I could finally say we walked them in and had to eat one of them, but <laughs> we got our work done there. But uh, on that last day, it was again clouded in, and uh, at one point we kept seeing some gaps opening up and see a little bit of blue sky, and then it would fade in again. And we were just all laying there on the ground, just waiting, hoping it would burn off, and then all of a sudden we kept hearing helicopters off in the distance that got closer and then he just appeared out of the clouds and he landed and his eyes were all big and he was yelling at the other government folks in French and like very frantically and so he called us over and said we got to go right now and so we threw everything on the helicopter got back in and it had all closed in again on us and but I mean we had nothing above us so he just it went up and then suddenly, boom, we're right above the clouds. It's a blue sky. We could just see off in the distance. But he wanted us to get in because the one gap in the mountains where we needed to go through to get back into town, he said, was already closing in when he came. And we need that was our only way out. Otherwise, we would have to go much further away and probably land on the beach. And there basically was no fuel anywhere at that point. So, uh, and he was already basically right at that point where we had barely enough to get back. And so we got up and we're heading towards this gap. And you could, it was like Indiana Jones. You kind of heard the, <laughs> the music going. Just as we're approaching it, it's just closing in on us. And we just finally made it through right when it closed in front of us. But you could already see where we're going. And then as we're approaching town, he pointed at the gas gauge and it's already at E. And, but, we somehow, obviously, I'm still alive. So, oh, yeah, that was that. That was kind of the cloud conditions, and then it just came right back in as, as we were loading everything up. So, yeah, last day there, we got to finally relax on one of the offshore islands where nautiluses just wash up on the beach. There, nobody there. Really nice, and got all our plant material together, and got our permits, and then Atlanta Botanic Garden got them all going for us. So. 
we were doing some DNA work with some of the pathogens that were affecting them as well. So that is. So yeah, I started working for Peckerwood Garden, which was quite an honor because of this guy here, John Ferry, who was just one of those legendary plant collectors out there who I'd always looked up to. If you um, ever heard of uh, Yakutu Nursery, that he was a co-founder of that, and he formed this garden basically based off of all his Mexican, Northeast Mexican collections. He was just one of those few folks that was several times a year just going into uh, the Sierra Madre Oriental and Tamaulipas and Nuevo León and some of the adjacent states in Mexico, just bringing back all these crazy plants, trialing them outside of Houston. And, uh, and he's an artist too, so just making these landscapes out of plants that just nobody else had. And then as they would survive, he would then um, propagate them and sell them to Yuck Deer Nursery. And, I was always a loyal customer as a young punk growing up. And so and then I, when he decided to start stepping back, he needed a garden director and never thought I'd get it. But then I did and worked there a number of years after he passed recently. And this garden was really known for a lot of yuccas and agaves and a lot of the dryland plants that uh, they all introduced. But that was really only a part of the story there. He was also doing all these uh, woody plants and uh, kind of understory things. Like this here, the bronzy foliage thing is something I saw today. Uh, Boone County Arboretum, the uh, Lindera angustifolia. Um, gets yellow fall color and then it'll hold on to its dead leaves. So that's all you're seeing are dead leaves. Um, if it's just sticking out in the lawn basically all by its own it just looks like a tree with dead leaves but all these compositions that john ferry created uh with all these different plants and get all the other fall color at the same time it just really adds to the color and light penetrates down and get these warm bronzy tones with, with the foliage there but yeah we just create all these different uh scenes all through the garden there and mix desert plants with non-desert plants we really like working with just colors and textures, very, very little in the way of flowers. We had a lot of um, garden groups come by that just expected flowers and they were all kind of upset that it was more about the textures and the architectural features of all these mm -hmm. plants here. And some of them would get it, other ones just were totally lost on it and would go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But working at uh, Peckerwood, um, I was now in Texas, remember? Big Ben drawing me back there. And so now I'm working for an institution. I can be getting like permits for doing work in the national park there. Steel plants, like I did for not that I was going to do that anyway. But uh, um, so yeah, I started up some uh, projects there working with the oaks. Uh, they had really always uh, caught my interest and realized they were just a total mess there and poorly studied. But so many other plants there that. Uh, um, Botanists have really scratched the surface. So, I mean, these things we know about, but we just keep finding new plants out there all the time, especially when you go down to private land. Most of Texas is privately owned. There's no like uh, BLM land like a lot of the Western states out there that uh, where you can just easily access and go exploring. If you do that on the private land, you're like, we get shot out there. Uh, you, and usually, if you tell them, hey, I'd like to go explore looking for plants, they don't want you out there. They just tell you now, shove a gun in your face. but. Uh, Eventually, we would make good uh, connections and just find all sorts of crazy things. The orchids uh, that grows in the desert looks like something you'd see in South Africa, but it's grown out in the mountains in West Texas with prickly pears. And so we've got seeds of this going now at, at Longwood Gardens. Peter Sale up there is uh, working on the protocols to get this one going here. Uh, apparently, from some from some folks in Mexico have grown it and say it's like really easy, like a great garden plant. So once we can crack the code of that uh, in vitro propagation in the lab and get them going in pots, I mean, hoping this can be a, a thing here. And Maria, this is one that uh, just one of those little weird plants that it was known in the early part of the 1900s, but uh, um, from one site and nobody had just bothered to go check on it. And, Many, many decades. So, my friend Michael Lee Sun, who took this photo here, he's with uh, San Antonio Botanic Garden. He and I do a lot of work together. Um, went out and he just did a ton of exploring and kind of the general area we knew uh, many, many days out there and eventually found it. And that's basically the site 
it's this one little pocket in this uh, limestone uh, ridge here. Sorry, if my microphone keeps drifting. Um, it looks pretty big there, but really like those shrubs are only like five or six feet tall. And there's about six plants in there. And we searched all over the place and can't find any more. And we kind of figured out after the fact that that was the original site, just based on some vague details, it all just kind of matched up in terms of it being a canyon that was oriented northeasterly and just that it's a different position. So as far as anybody knows, that's the only place it lives anywhere on earth. And uh, so we've um, been going up there to uh, propagate it now, but every time we go, if they're in some extreme drought and uh, like uh, on the left there, it had just flowered, but everything just wilted at the same time too. So we never got any seed and all the cutting material wasn't optimum. So. Um, photo on the left was one little shoot I found that still had any uh, signs of life to it that year. But uh, we're going to try again this coming year here. They got a lot of rain this past fall here, but it was a little bit too late for getting cuttings. Kind of a cool ironweed. Uh, this is actually found in only one little stream bed in West Texas and nowhere else, but it's actually become a common garden plant in Denver of all places. The uh, plant select uh, um, program out there, they're uh, pushing this. It's in Lowe's and Home Depot. Mm -hmm. and otherwise it's found in that one little stream bed and that's it. And uh, so that's a great success story. That's what we're trying to do here. Get these things around. And not just West Texas, even though that's just such an amazing place. Even East Texas has its own uh, um, amazing features. Basically, the southeastern woodlands extend into East Texas. Texas is not all a desert. It's uh, such a huge state. It's bigger than many countries. It's got a lot uh, um, of different, uh, it's got prairies, it's baptisias, it's got these sandstone barrens with its unique complement of flora. Our endemic trillium taxonum. We have a yellow liatris. You ever know any of those existed? There's more than just purple ones. And they're actually kind of yellow and white. And they're not really, those aren't the flowers that are contributing the colors. Uh, the way you're seeing there in, with the yellow and the white are actually just the bracts. The flowers are the little white things that are sticking out of those little star-shaped uh, bracts there, the calices. But still, I mean, just to have something yellow like that in the landscape is pretty uh, Pretty different from everything else that we tend to grow in that genus. It's a weird little thing that uh, I never knew existed until I stumbled upon it. it just grows in one little sandstone uh, area out there. There's a couple of species of that are pretty ugly, but this is pretty showy. And uh, Scott Ogden, who some of you may, might know, is a well-known uh, landscaper and plant collector. Uh, one day he was talking about the coconut lilies. Like, what are you talking about? I didn't know what that was a common name for. And, you know, the Shona column. And it's like, what do they smell like coconut? It's like, how have you missed it? I'm always bad about smelling things in the wild. So next year when they flowered, I walked out there and that's all I could smell was coconut everywhere. I mean, just overpowering. I don't know how I didn't notice it before. And it's just a, a great uh, plant. It's very easy in the landscape. And so it's starting to uh, get some traction there among the folks that are doing plants for like a prairie restoration, things like that. But uh, I mean, it just makes quite a spectacle in the wild there. And then down in South Texas, there's all sorts of palm trees down there. There's these weird uh, Amorexia ridei. I have these big flowers that are always cocked at a 45 degree angle for some reason. And they make these cool uh, seed pods there. Central Texas, Texas is known for their blue bonnets, but we look for cooler stuff. Blue bonnets are nice, but it's all these wonderful blue ferns instead. Um, these are all dryland species and uh, uh, they grow in rocky areas and deserts and things, but they still situate themselves where there's a little bit more moisture persistent after uh, rainfall. So in little deep cracks of rocks and things. So I got two species of ferns there, the Astrolepus on the left and the Argyrocosma on the right. That's just this turquoise color that's just hard to photograph. Just looks fake out in the wild. Nothalina Copelandia. I just think all these are great options for rock gardens. Um, people have dabbled in these over the years, but uh, with more of a resurgence now in just rock gardening and crevice gardening, I mean, these are naturals and I have people asking me for them all the time. So um, 
in a Bartlett Art Freedom. We're not just doing woody plants anymore. We're doing everything. And so we're installing a crow's garden now. I'm starting to collect these and also get them around to other gardens and folks that uh, want them. Got these wonderful little natural crevice gardens here with the Myriopter Slinheimeri with the Claret Cup Cactus there and other things. It's on Enchanted Rock, if you're familiar with that in west of Austin. That's how the ferns grow there. They're just in these little nooks and crannies among these boulders. That's just all solid granite. Some of them are like pretty much white, just due to all the density of the hairs on them, which is just kind of helps with their uh, desert adapt adaptations. It's a water conserving feature of a lot of these things. It's hard to see detail on the monitor here, but uh, just the textures these things take on, they're just absolutely amazing. And this fern is infamous for being named after Lady Gaga. Um, nothing against Lady Gaga, but uh, I don't know. I just think it's ridiculous to name a fern after a celebrity. That's kind of what happened here. They're, the person who described it, their excuse was when they did the DNA sequencing on this, uh, there was a GAGA -GA, uh, repetition in there for the guanine nadine and uh, they were playing Lady Gaga at the time in the lab, and <laughs> they just figured it's of course. so whatever. But it was like the only one in the genus Calanthes that didn't move to Myriopterus got moved to Gaga just due to that. So I don't know, but uh, I'm crotchety in my older age you now. I just don't like Latin names named after people for some reason. I don't want anything named after me, and I don't know. I like more descriptive names like our gyrocosmo microphylla just rolls off the tongue. <laughs> <laughs> I think this has tremendous horticultural potential. This is it in the wild, but uh, in a cultivated setting, makes nice little buns on the ground there. It's deciduous, but uh, I mean, it has great texture. Tell what it is. Close, a great family. Poison ivy. This is a uh, West Texas. This is what it looks like once it starts climbing. It looks maybe a little bit more recognizable with the leaves of three. No, it's uh, probably an undescribed species. It only occurs in a few canyons out in West Texas. And uh, yeah, people have just overlooked this. It's just in a, a few little spots there, but just absolutely beautiful. If we, I mean, people grow cactus and they poke us and stuff, but there's dangerous plants that are popular. Why can't poison ivy be popular too? <laughs> I used to uh, joke with people when I worked at Canapa Botanic Garden in Florida, um, poison ivy was just one of our main weeds. And I learned that with our uh, volunteers and community service workers, if I didn't tell them what poison ivy was, they wouldn't react to it. And so we would have like long term volunteers just weeding it out barehanded for months until a visitor would be come through and say, you know, that's poison ivy, right? And then all of a sudden they would react that day. And there is research to show that, yeah, there are people that are sensitive to it, but a good portion of, of uh, the population has psychosomatic responses to it. So they've done studies on that. But everybody says, no, no, I get reactions. But yes, people do. but. I, I don't react to it. I just never believed in it, is what I tell people. So <laughs> try not to believe in anything like, that might hurt me. And uh, with just working in Texas mainly, we've just kind of learned as we share plants around here that uh, not always, but with a high uh, rate of success, we can be moving these plants from that region into the Pacific Northwest, the maritime, <clears throat> maritime. Uh, climates of uh, California, up to Chicago, all the way up to like Massachusetts, down to the hot, humid Florida. And that same plant will do well in most of those cases, in many cases, not all cases, but there are very few other places in the country where you could take plants and just grow them in so many different areas. And uh, I mean, my theory is just because during the ice ages, all the plants were getting pushed down into Central America there, and then things would advance back north, basically. That was the bottleneck. So you get all these different genetics that are kind of mixing when they're kind of condensed in that area. And then a lot of things end up persisting on all the diverse geology that's in the, the state. They don't need to be further north necessarily. They're more looking for that, that right substrate. And so, uh, 
So that may be what accounts for it. So it's a very unique place to be looking for plants that we can just spread all over the place for landscapes or various uh, purposes, even for conservation, we can back it up in multiple gardens. We don't need to only find ones that are willing to do so in, in Texas. So, and sometimes it's good to get these things away from their natural populations. We're seeing all these new things like Emerald Ash Borer and new, new exotic pests that come in and wipe things out in their native range. It's good to have a good diverse amount of genetics other places. So that's a lot of, uh, when I worked for the forest pathology lab, that was really um, eye-opening for me. So that's why I strongly believe in getting these things around, even though there's obviously ethical issues we need to take into consideration with things becoming maybe invasive somewhere else. We, we work through that rather than just thinking black and white and saying we shouldn't do it. So knowing this, I mean, we get involved with uh, various uh, uh, collecting uh, initiatives. This is one of the plant collecting collaboratives uh, that Chicago Botanic Garden was uh, um, has been uh, kind of coordinating. Uh, this was uh, Boyce Tankersley from Chicago Botanic and uh, Bill McLaughlin, who was at uh, U.S. Botanic Garden and Tess Caracina in the back there, who was at Chanticleer. And uh, myself, we just went all through um, Central Texas collecting all sorts of stuff, seeds, and get them distributed to other gardens for trial just with the focus on the conservation work. And we did another one in East Texas and may have some other ones planned and come back to the hotel and spread clean seeds on your bed and it's fun stuff. <laughs> but also there's things like this. I don't know, uh, this plant here uh, might recognize it. It seems like other parts of the country it gets used very commonly as a garden bedding plant annual. Mm -hmm. Sometimes straw that's sold as strawberry fields. <clears throat> Down further south, it's like in those uh, cheap uh, little six packs of annuals and things like that every year. But in the wild, it's only been recorded in the past in a few counties in Texas and then uh, a few sites in Mexico. And in Texas, at least, we've revisited all those documented sites. We can't find it. So it may be extinct in the state. We kept visiting these sites after periods of rainfall, hoping maybe they've come out of the woodwork or. And we're always keeping our eyes open, but to date, nobody's been able to find it. So it's one of those things, too. Again, it's firmly established in cultivation, but we don't know its status. So at least on the U.S. side, it is present in Mexico to a degree, but who knows? Could lose it there, too, at some point. Kind of an oak most people would think would, is boring, but uh, another thing that this one is only present on the U.S. side of the border with only a few individuals on top of one peak in the Davis Mountains in West Texas. And so um, it never gets the attention just because there's flashier oaks out there that uh, people might want to conserve, that people are funding at, as opposed to this lowly thing. It just looks like a little scrubby oak here, but I'm scrubby, I'm ugly. I, I so, hope someone cares about me too. So these plants need love also. So. We've been working on getting this propagated as well, and it never produces acorns, so we have to actually propagate it vegetatively. So we basically backed up that entire population since there's so few in cultivation, getting those spread around to various gardens. Mm -hmm. Quercus hinklei is another one. Um, it's really, it's kind of neat. It's got those holly-shaped leaves on it, very small. Just makes that little scraggly uh, mound on the ground out in the limestone slopes there. Where the X's are, those are the only two sites that exist and nowhere else. And uh, what we found with this, though, is real nice red new growth. Um, when we propagate this and we grow this other places, like East Texas, where it's a lot more humid, and put in better, richer soil, um, suddenly it turns into like a, a big luxurious tree. It still keeps those nice silvery leaves that look like a little holly leaves, but uh, it just kind of breathes a sigh of relief doesn't say that little ground hugging pathetic thing. These are some at San Antonio Botanic Gardens. And there's some in Houston that are even bigger uh, uh, trees that uh, Lynn Lowry planted a long time ago. But it just goes to show that a lot of these things in West Texas don't necessarily want to be there. They, they're just kind of fizzling out. Things do go extinct. Even, even though we're having lots of impacts on the planet, things were do go naturally extinct too. And this was probably on its way out because it's well known that whole West Texas area used to be cooler and wetter. And it's ever since the last ice age, it's just been uh, turning more into a desert. So these things just kind of shrunk down and they're just kind of sitting there, just kind of pissed off. And 
and would probably just be disappearing, which has been a dilemma with our global conservation concern and for oaks. They just think that, oh, well, it's rare. Let's go propagate and replant more in the wild. Well, it doesn't want to be there. So it brings up that ethical question on do we save something that was naturally going extinct, which I say yes, we have a lot to learn from that. But it's fruitless to be putting resources into thinking we can just thicken up the populations uh, in the wild there. These are all the cuttings that we took from Curtis Hinkler and depressive bees that are reading on the mist bench. Mm -hmm. Then back to East Texas. I, I try not to like orchids for the longest time. <laughs> At least once I got out of Florida, I liked all the apathetic orchids. But then when I moved north, all these terrestrial orchids, I just, everybody likes them. I just didn't want to like them because of that. But orchids have this allure that just draws you in. You can't help it. And in East Texas, uh, we had these uh, Kentucky lady slippers where we had only like 13 individuals, I think it is nowadays, and they're all just very randomly spread out. There's no cross pollination among those uh, individual plants. And uh, it gets called lady slipper. It doesn't look like a slipper. Some European ones do. But uh, ever since someone pointed out to me, here, this will be something you think about every time you see a lady slipper. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like Stan. <laughs> but uh, so I decided one year I was just. Uh, this was when I was working for myself. I just decided, self-funded, I'm going to go around and pollinate every individual. I'm going to swap pollen between individuals here and uh, get as much uh, mixing and matching of pollen here, just get as much genetic diversity in the seeds and uh, get these backed up. Uh, Peter Zale up at Longwood Gardens, who was doing that other work that I mentioned earlier, was they have plenty of resources there. They were all for it. So he was ready to take on the seed. So. Went around and visited every one. I collected some pollen off of one, would go drive two hours to the next one and find it wasn't quite open yet. So I'd have to take the pollen back home three hours away and then take it back again when I thought it might be open and put it on there and collect some pollen from that and take on another one. And, and uh, so I did that a lot. One population here that was like a mile back in the woods, maybe not quite that far, three quarters of a mile or so. I'd arrived too late, it was dark already, and it was, it was a thunderstorm with lightning all over, And but I'd come all that way, and I, uh, I don't know, I just decided to see if I could find it without a flashlight. And uh, you could, all I could see were just the illuminations of the, the lightning, and I could make out some trees every now and then. And, yeah, it was kind of fun, I don't want to get that risk dying a lightning strike, whatever, but, uh, Eventually, I made it out there and, and found them without the flashlight. They were just kind of glowing in the lightning. And uh, I turned off my flashlight and I tried to just get a photo with my phone of just what I was seeing. This is just totally illuminated by the lightning. Just a neat, uh, just a neat experience just sitting there in the pouring rain with just constant flashless strobe of lightning all around. And just that was the one thing in the forest that was just lighting up there. It was just a really neat thing. Get to have some really cool experiences sometimes. Another orchid keeps doing. So I went back and had seed pods on every single one I pollinated. So I was feeling good. Collected uh, most of them. We didn't have, they were on the national forest land and we uh, um, were required to leave some of them there for natural dispersal in case they germinated, which uh, I think it's pretty low likelihood, but we'll see. So I, I just figured one, I calculated out how many miles I drove just going back and forth, pollinating these orchids and collecting pollen and checking on things that weren't ready. And basically from my house, it was near College Station, northwest of Houston to various points in Eastern Texas. I totaled 2,649 miles, which is mm -hmm. getting close to the width of the United States. And this was when I was poor and self-funded. Just the passion in me, I can't help it. Uh, we sent the seeds to Longwood Gardens and they get them going in test tubes and they start out looking like things you don't want to see in the toilet after some international travel. But uh, eventually they get some leaves on them and start looking like an actual plant. And we're going to be planting these out in the wild in several, several different sites uh, uh, next month here. Uh, just try to pick them up, see if they survive. But it's maybe another thing where they just don't want to be there. Um, but we've got plenty of them backed up in cultivation and shared around other gardens as well. Working with the uh, wrap out here real quick, but working with the uh, Global Genome Initiative, and that's not only collecting living material of plants and seeds, but also collecting DNA of plants and getting it stored in biorepositories. So if 
um, either something goes extinct, we have all that genetic material preserved for researchers down the road. Um, and uh, it all gets cataloged. And so basically, there's an entire database of plant tissue that any researchers can access around the world. And uh, they don't need to mount an expedition to go uh, get this material. Uh -huh. Take our barium specimens with everything we collect, either the living or the uh, genetic material. And heat always helps with drying these specimens. And you can always rely on cats until it gets a little crazy here and then they fight and then the other one will be on top and you can see all the scratch marks on the side there and you have to move them. <laughs> People work too. This was uh, uh, the guy on the, the right was Andrew Hitt from Morton Arboretum and Wesley Knapp from Nature Sir. We were collecting oaks in West Texas last year and Andrew would just always throw himself on top of the stacks as we were making them just to crush them down. So yeah, and then I ended up at uh, Bartlett Research Laboratories in Arboretum. I was sharing plants with them forever, and they just basically approached me and said, hey, we're growing. We want to keep getting as much diversity as we can, and we just want to enable you. So it's been a great job to just be bringing in anything and everything. It's not just woody plants anymore like they have traditionally been doing. They want to do everything and have that conservation focus on it. So it's just like, where do I begin? I'm going in so many directions now, and I never take a day off basically because it's basically a vacation every day and I get this so-called vacation time but I don't know when I'm going to use what I'm going to use that for because it's just such a great thing but yeah the arboretum has been traditionally set up as a typical arboretum all the trees that are spaced out and lawn like environment and have your taxonomically arranged collections your oak collections maple collections who have the largest magnolia collection cultivated magnolia collection in the world and getting there with the um several other groups of plants there but now we're starting to look at the understory there and also the areas in between not having that mowed grass so looking at more like prairie restorations where we can have some of these rare plants that uh, used to either grow in the area or other parts of the world where we can have these populations of genetics within there and so it's at 360 acres and growing and they keep buying up more land around it there's charlotte uh, north carolina and gulfs all around it um, so we keep planting more, and that's how we fight off the eminent domain grabs. We just basically tell them there's endangered plants there and they can't take it. <laughs> Some of you might know Greg Page. He's been the curator there for, uh, I think, 15 or so years. And so he's uh, just done a lot of uh, the coordination of just making it what it is today. And uh, so uh, um, honored to be helping him. He's done his own amount of plant exploration to uh, Vietnam and China and Taiwan as well. Wrapping it up, this was an oak that we, uh, it was deemed extinct. We went on an expedition to go find it because we realized that nobody had really surveyed for it enough. And we had mules uh, dragging our equipment up to this little cabin that was ripped apart by bears. And um, we spent a whole week up there just surveying and then uh, uh, that's Michael Eason from San Antonio Botanic Garden, who I mentioned before. He ended up being the one among our team. We were walking through the woods, just like people look for dead bodies. And in his uh, line of sight was uh, this new tree that uh, we found was uh, not extinct after all. And uh, then we found another one on that trip, too. And it's very sick, so we're going to be taking uh, Andrew Lloyd was one of our Bartlett pathologists out here this winter to do an assessment on it. And we're also going to be collecting cuttings of it to graft to get it backed up in cultivation. So we got a little group of oh, that's our team that found it. And Morton Arboretum made a press release and it made news all around the world just about the extinct tree. But attention in the process, we found a new tree that never been recorded from the U.S. It's known from Mexico further south, where the Sideroxylo found two individuals of that. And then following up on a nerve-bearing specimen we, uh, that was didn't have an ID, we went out to this one little canyon, basically that, you can see that one little green area um, on the right side of where that mountain slopes down. It's like a little moist canyon back there. Went back there and found this oak that is clearly distinct from anything else now. There's three individuals there. They're big, giant things. There's no seedlings or anything. So lots of stuff to be found out there. Oh, I forgot I had all this 
Variegated plants are just with these horrible, disgusting cacti that we find. I hate them, but other people like them, so we still suffer through it and collect them for, for those of you that do like that sort of horribleness. And then speaking of vomit, you probably, you might know, I don't know if you can grow it up here, the Ilex vomitoria. I found a variegated one. I just named it speed milk, but a friend of mine said, hey, it's yellow. It's not white like milk. So we started thinking about like, well, if there's bile involved and things like that, it may stick on the yellow, but then he just, uh, someone suggested they can all go check. So. We're getting that propagated now. I like it because of the name. And finally, you guys might know Slender Silhouette, Sweet Gum, the columnar one. Um, I was driving through uh, Missouri, uh, actually coming back from Chicago to Tankard and heading back to Texas, and I spotted this thing alongside the road. And I thought it was a Slender Silhouette, but it was just such an odd place because it's not in the natural area. So I did a U turn and uh, went over and checked it out just to see if there was anything there that would have led me to believe someone planted it. There wasn't. And it was just clearly not slender silhouette um, because all the branches are going upright. If you ever see some of the slender silhouettes out at Boone County Arboretum where they start splaying and basically uh, that's what it's supposed to look like, but that's those are the ones out at these are some of, some of Chris's photos there. Where, he calls it sloppy silhouette. And so that's been a problem with this cultivar for a while. They get this get to a size where they start looking horrible and you either have to you prune them up all the time or you just finally give up on it. And uh, the one thing I noticed is that slender silhouette, you can kind of see on the left there, the branches do like kind of like a weird spiraling thing. And I think that leads to structural integrity, whereas it's, uh, it's hard to see in this photo, but this is an 80 foot tall tree. And every, every single one of those uh, branches is straight and um, does not uh, splay at all. It's got two liters, so it's a little bit uh, asymmetric, but just thinking uh, about when we can get this going and get train them into single liters, just have something really narrow, I think will be a big improvement over that. So find these weird little mutants also that uh, will hopefully be. Uh, Things we can add to the landscape. I named it Uptight. Um, <laughs> that was after a lot of discussions, uh, ser very serious discussions, where the conversation always went to something phallic. But uh, yeah. one of them was like, because it's the show me state, it was like show me state of <laughs> show me state of arousal, or I don't know. But figured Uptight's more commercial. <laughs> Missouri Tool was another one. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I. Sorry, I went too long here, Bob. But uh, yeah, um, a lot of good stuff out there. A lot of good stuff that uh, a lot of people are doing. Chris Stone, folks at the zoo here. I mean, everywhere, all across the country. I mean, we're all trying to work together and get plants around, get plants saved. And for me, too, just again, maintain my sanity. <laughs> all right. Well, that was awesome. Thanks again, Adam. And uh, so real quickly, we're going to give you a, a brief rundown of what all we've been doing with the tree fund in the last few years. Uh, we have been out to the U.S. National Arboretum. There it is. There's a tree now. So a few years ago, we went out to the U.S. National Arboretum. I didn't actually go, but Steve Wills, who's here in this audience, volunteered to drive his, his Yukon over to D.C. area and picked up a bunch of plants uh, from the U.S. National for us. We also went to uh, Chicago Botanic Garden. Uh, actually, I didn't go to that one either. Uh, Steve and uh, Greg Ammon went up to Chicago Botanic Garden and grabbed a bunch of plants for us. Um, I was able to go down to Lamb Botanic Garden myself and get some stuff from them also a few years ago. We didn't put that in there. Um, and then also this past year, we've established a, a new relationship with Isley Nursery, which is out in Oregon. Uh, we've got a wonderful uh, quasi-donation uh, plants for con our conifer collection. So that's uh, really exciting. Also this year, uh, we started uh, working a lot with Proven Winters. We are now at Proven Winters Trial Garden, which we're very proud of. And uh, they have lots of hydrangeas, and we planted a ton of hydrangeas this year, among other things. So those are some of the exciting things we're doing uh, with the funding that we received from this event uh, that you're at tonight. So we do appreciate you coming. Uh, we do appreciate all that you've done over the years to support the Arboretum, and we hope that you continue to do so for us. So I'm going to let you all go check out your plants. Uh, we also have a ton of food. So um, now we're going to start the Q&A. So question and answer session with Adam Black.
All right, so there's one question from Zoom and we'll take some questions from you all if you have any, but uh, the question was, what steps are uh, am I taking to not propagate and spread the next potential invasive plant considering the diversification of the gene pool and geographic transfer? And it's one of those things that someone actually asked me that here earlier. It's, um, it's one of those dilemmas where you can either just assume the worst and not do it, or you can take the careful route and plant things out, monitor them closely, make sure they're not gonna be seeding around and becoming the next problem or cross-pollinating with our native uh, relatives. Um, so it, it's kind of a case by case basis. Um, and uh, really it, it's all down to just initial nurseries or gardens or even collectors just really paying attention. I mean, at this point in time, we know certain plant families that are predisposed to becoming quite invasive wherever we move them, like the aster family and things that birds distribute. Uh, those are always things we need to be cautious about. So um, we just, yeah, we just have to kind of do our research and, uh, um, and, and it may be fine in one place, one part of the country and then move another place and may, may become their next weed. So it may be something that we need to limit to where we grow it as well. I think as one person put it once, uh, you don't, Rhinos aren't something everybody's going to keep in their yard, but we can keep them at a zoo just to go see them and learn from them and everything. That's kind of, I think, initially just uh, the duty of botanic gardens to kind of become that zoo and uh, um, care for them, yet knowing if this gets out, it could be. So. Any other questions? Adam, here's another microphone. I'll give you this one so you can talk to it. I'll carry that around. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Adam, first of all, thank you. We really enjoyed your talk. And uh, I'd like to ask you, uh, the lady slippers, could you describe the exact environment? Like when you discovered them and you found them, what was the soil like? What was their setting? Were they in dark shade? I mean, pure shade? I mean, can you give us some, you know, description of exactly the setting of these lady slippers wild in, in, in the wild and what they thrive and like? Yeah, so basically they're, at least in East Texas, they, they do, that species occurs in other places in the Southeast, but there they're restricted to these uh, uh, really deeply cut ravines uh, in these uh, woodlands. Um, and there's always water running below them. They're, all, they're, all, they're never more than about six or eight feet above that water. So it, it stays really humid down there, shaded at least uh, in the afternoon. Um, oftentimes north facing slopes as opposed to the south facing. So always stays a little bit cooler microclimate. Um, and interestingly, they're always in this uh, contact zone between uh, this acidic sand above it and this limestone there below it. So they grow right in that kind of transition zone. So like, they like that soil chemistry there. That's not the case necessarily with other sites, but, um, um, but at least in Texas, that's what they like. So very narrow in where they want to grow. And again, like I said, they just due to those sites kind of disappearing and also just with changing environments, uh, they may be on their way out, uh, maybe before any human impacts not that we're not helping yeah. make that happen quicker. But, uh, yeah. We can at least get them propagated, try them in cooler climates and cultivation and preserve those genetics here. So they weren't in pure acidic soil? No. But I know people that grow them in acidic conditions without issue. A lot of it is probably due to when those seeds are germinating, you know how most orchids need a fungus to be able to germinate. That may be the, the critical factor there, what that fungus actually wants, that mycorrhiza that, uh, that they like to, uh, um, that those seeds need to basically land on to be able to germinate and turn into a, a mature plant. The other interesting thing about that is uh, in my, Ron Dieterman, who I mentioned earlier, used to be at Atlanta Botanic Garden, did a lot of orchid work. He noticed that almost always they're in the drip line of a uh, um, flowering dog, Cornus, Florida. And it's, we're kind of thinking, and, and ever since he said that, I've been looking at them. Every single one is within the root zone of a Cornus, Florida. And so there must be some micro, mycorrhizal relationship there. Um, we're going to, when we plant some out in the wild, we're actually going to be planting some around some existing um, dogwoods there, just to see if it makes a difference. It may just only 
be a difference again just for that seedling germination it may not matter after that point because we can obviously grow in cultivation without a dog with there without even mycorrhizae but it might lead to more vigorous plants there we don't know so we're going to have a student at Stephen at Boston University just do a study on this so there's there's a lot going on all these inter interactions and in, below the soil level become more complex of the more we look at it Next question. Anybody else have another question? Coming to you. A lot of people already asked me questions right afterwards. Right. So Do we have any new on. Zoom questions? Nope. Oh, come on. Somebody has something they want to ask. Don't be shy. <laughs> so back to the orchids. When you find something really special like that, and then you go back time and again and again, do you have a concern of somebody finding that and picking it up? And oh, yeah. Um, in fact, do you find like it's better not to advertise it? Or, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. In fact, uh, most of the ones, at least with the lady slippers we're working with, are on national forest land. And the national forest botanist has told us to not tell anybody where they are. He just doesn't want anybody to know about them. Um, there was someone that came with us one time that uh, he even knows that botanist knew, thought they were okay, but then suddenly, on, if you're familiar with iNaturalist, a point shows up on iNaturalist marking one of these orchids. And I only learned about it because there's a Facebook group in Texas called Texas Flora, and suddenly people said, oh, look what I found. They're posting photos of this, and people are like, where did you find this? Like, oh, it's on iNaturalist. So... Need to get in there and get that point obscured. So people do know about that one now, and so we're kind of worried about it. But otherwise, most of them are pretty far off the beaten path. So, but yeah, it's a it's a constant. Right? So I've got a question. What is your favorite plant exploration trip that you have gone on yourself personally? What's your favorite one? Where to begin? New Caledonia is up there. I've been there three times and never gets old. I yeah, I don't know. I guess my next trip to somewhere I haven't been yet that's on my list. So what is the next trip? Talking about that now. I mean, right now that I really want to get back to Taiwan, but uh, just with political issues there and COVID issues, I just want to get in there as quickly as possible but uh, before anything changes. But uh, I don't know, we're talking about uh, partnering with Denver Patent Garden on their work they've been doing with uh, in uh, uh, the Caucasus as well as uh, Argentina, just because of similar plants there we can be growing. So yeah, I think that now that I'm working for Bartlett, I mean, the focus is gonna be on things that we can actually grow, but not necessarily. I mean, we will still collect things that we can get to other gardens as well. And we do have a new arboretum up in Oregon now that will open up the possibilities of what we can get away with. I see some questions. I'm just assuming that you, uh, these days, you use GPS when you find plants so that you can go back can find it again makes it a hell of a lot easier, I would think. Oh yeah, definitely. I used to do this before I broke down and finally got a GPS unit. And uh, I don't know. Usually, I can find my way back to places, but still, we uh, we do document them. And again, we take herbarium specimens if if we can. If it's one plant and that's it, we'll do a photographic record. But uh, um, on the herbarium and they will have the location. So if anybody downstream needs to find it, the herbarium usually will make sure it's someone trustworthy to be able to share that with. But uh, they will know kind of the terms of being able to share that material, that information. So I wonder what non-native trees and plants you would recommend for landscaping here in Kentucky? Well, today was my first introduction to what actually grows here. 
Um, so I, this is a new area for me. I've just not spent enough time here and uh, definitely want to come back and learn more. I, I was surprised to see a lot of the things that uh, heard my first visit to, to the Arboretum here and to, um, to uh, Spring Grove and uh, talked with Chris about what he's failed with in the past and what has prospered. And there, there's been a lot of surprises. Like I was surprised when I gave him some of those uh, uh, Sweet Bay Magnolias. Those are very southerly, um, southern sources from Alabama. And so I was just at, asking him first, I, and if these will survive, if you had them survive yet, I'll bring them. And he's like, well, yeah, those are doing great here. So you just really never know. It's all in trial and trial. And don't most Southern people down on the Gulf, Gulf Coast kind of hate, not hate, but like don't really like Magnolia Virginiana. It's kind of yeah. like weedy tree to them. Yeah, it's one of those things that nurseries, I mean, they're around, you can find them like a native nurseries, but it's just been surprising just driving around here, just seeing how often it's used in the landscape, which is great. Um, I guess people see them out in the swamps and just don't make the connection that they can also grow this in the landscape and be an attractive plant. <laughs> A lot of great selections out there too for form and leaf retention and various uh, ornamental features. I have a question. Um, do you have any suggestions for like a very young arboretum on acquiring plant material or building relationships? Um, well, I did it the hard way being a total introvert and never wanting to associate with a lot of those people initially, but uh, I don't know, I just kind of bit the bullet and just started putting myself out there. And uh, just, I think nowadays with social media, I mean, you got a lot of good people in like some of these more special groups, whether it's regionally focused or focused on a particular plant group, it's a good mix of amateurs and professionals. So you can kind of get to know people that way. So I think that's been really good. Um, for getting to know people depending on what your interests are so definitely recommend that just connecting with folks and uh showing how serious you are and how passionate you are and uh um yeah just going from there but also just get out there and um know the legalities but collect stuff start getting stuff that you can't find anywhere else and make them available to other people have, have people take interest in that as well that's a lot of what i did i just People started coming to me when they learned all this uh, cool stuff that I had that uh, I was willing to share, but I, I just never initially put myself out there because it wasn't my nature. I kind of come out of that shell over time and look at the no folks mower and never liked being that way. Anymore. So, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. So, we have a lot of young people here tonight that are in school and studying at horticulture. We have quite a few students that came out tonight. What would you recommend they do to prepare themselves for a career in something like you're doing, doing plant exploration, plant research? Uh, change your major. <laughs> if you want money. Um, yeah, I mean, I know so many passionate people that are uh, doing it regardless of the money, but uh, yeah, I don't know. It's a difficult field, but it seems to be changing quite a bit. Um, and it really depends on your path within the field, I think. Um, and it's a difficult situation. I get, ever since I started having just tons of followers on Instagram, which totally blows my mind. Um, and it's a, good, it's a good thing, especially a lot of younger people. I get younger people contacting me and said, like, how do we be you? I, I want to basically go around the world chasing plants like you do all the time. And uh, it's like, well, I mean, I didn't do anything. I didn't, again, I didn't go to school for it. Not, I'm not saying don't go to school, but uh, it was more, and I've seen this in other people that are real standouts. It's more just the passion, have that passion. Um, I've seen a lot of people just, and no offense if this is you, but I've seen people that just have no interest in plants up to that point where they need to go to college and they, well, maybe I'll try this. And some people, it's worked out great. And they develop that passion. Other people, it just, it's a job to them and they want to work in it, but I don't know, just like I was saying before, I'm probably never going to take my vacation time. Be one of those people. And if, if that's not your field, maybe there's something else that you should be doing where, where you can make money, but you have to really look at yourself and I don't know, 
make things happen. <laughs> we really want it to work. That's a horrible answer. Isn't it? <laughs> this is our last question. We're ready now almost for the auction. So, uh, okay. Um, do you have any experience with a, a Davidia dove tree, handkerchief tree? Uh, have you seen good spe uh, specimens in the United States? And do you have a source for those? I killed them in Florida and quit growing them. Uh, we've got three at Bartlett Arboretum in, in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, and they're doing wonderfully. They flowered this year. Um, I've heard of other people failing with it in the Charlotte area, North Carolina. I think it may be dependent on site. I don't know enough. I don't have enough personal experience other than those are thriving, so it is possible there. Um, all the good specimens I've seen have been in the Pacific Northwest um, or in, or in uh, California where they have the cooler maritime climate. But um, and the nurseries out that direction are the ones that tend to have them on a more regular basis. So you just have to kind of watch some of the collector type nurseries and jump on them when they see them available. The ones that bloom, do you know how old they were? We had one flower, I'd have to look back at when it was planted, but uh, we had one flower this year, I heard for the first time, and it was only, um, I think like 12 feet tall. It's kind of a spindly little leader with a few uh, lateral branches. And uh, I was surprised to see it flowering at that point. But if it was reproduced from a cutting or grafted, it may be retaining that maturity from the mature plant it was propagated from. So as, a, as opposed to a seedling at that size too. So, and I'm not sure if that was a seedling or a grafted cutting propagated plant. So. It just depends. And again, that's something I, I just don't have, like from seed, I don't know at what age you start flowering. No, enough experience with that one. All right, so also if you're here tonight as an ISA certified arborist, we do have ISA TV sheets in the back.